Good afternoon, everybody. I hope you can hear me. Can I see a happy face? If I, you can hear me and you're excited about copyright this afternoon. Great. Yes, you'll get a link to the, the webinar and I can send the slides out as well. There's quite a bit of information in the slides and uh, let's go here. All right, making sense of copyright law and this is part three in our series. Um, just to begin with, I didn't put anything in about the learning intentions for today, but um, one thing I did want to mention is um, you see going through the presentation the various references to citation and I think that might be um, a takeaway today for, for teacher love brands. I think we have some classroom teachers on as well and um, welcome to everybody. But the, just the importance of citation for any of these uh, new provisions that have come in with the Copyright Modernization Act as well as some of the Supreme Court rulings we'll look at today. And I think that's good news for teacher librarians, but for everyone, and, and speaks to um, the importance of information ethics in 21st century learning. And I, I think that will be probably like, the most critical piece um, going forward, because with a lot of what we'll see today, it's, it's some incredible provisions that have been made for education, um, but they're only so good as um, as citation and showing respect for the copyright owners. So with, I guess with great power comes great responsibility. So watch today for references to citation and, and just note where sometimes we talk about citation as a good thing to do. It's also legally required. So that helps in uh, getting those bibliography lessons out um, and uh, et cetera. So making sense of copyright law. To begin with, I have to include a disclaimer because of the nature of the information that we'll be discussing today. So the information that will be provided and discussed does not constitute or replace legal advice. I'm not a lawyer, I'm a, I'm a teacher librarian, um, which isn't to say we don't know a lot about copyright, but it's very different than, <laughs> than legal advice. As well, because of the um, type of presentation and my attempts to summarize it in a PowerPoint format, I've used some sort of non-specific language um, summarizing and copyright very, very dependent on what language you use, uh, individual words. Uh, it's actually took me a really long time to put the presentation together because I was really thinking of the language. So just, just be aware of that, that there are some summary areas. And of course, if you have any um, questions about specific copyright situations, you should always check with district staff and there's resources at the end of this presentation uh, for more information, including the great uh, Copyright Matters, which has been revised, the, uh, the booklet from the uh, CMEC. There's our disclaimer for the day. So to begin with, just some real basics about copyright. It is um, an interesting act and in it's just called the Copyright Act, but like the um, say the, the Freedom of Information and Protection of Privacy Act, which in that particular act, you can tell in the name, it's freedom of information, but also protection of privacy. It, it's, it attempts to strike a balance between freedom and protection. So although copyright doesn't have that in its name, it's just copyright, it also um, is intended to provide protection as well as freedom. So for every right that, well, it's not an equal balance, but um, rights are given in the Act to authors and copyright owners, and rights are also given to users in the Act, and they, they do try um, to have balance. But depending on, on what you think, it, it may or may not be, and certainly some authors feel, or publishers perhaps, it goes too far, or not far enough, and, and vice versa on the part of users. But it does attempt to do both. Um, in addition to copyright, the Act also talks about moral rights. So copyright is uh, the right of the copyright owner to determine how a work that they own the copyright for will be used. And copyright only protects the expression of ideas, uh, not ideas themselves or names or facts. It, it's the expressions, the manifestations of the ideas. Um, 
copyright can be assigned. So if you, as an author, write a wonderful book, you can sell or assign that copyright to a publisher who then owns the rights and that you've um, provided to them. That's different from moral rights. Those are the rights of the author. And these can't be sold. They can only be extinguished. They're uh, absolutely critical and crucial rights around the work. Moral rights are the rights of the author to always be identified with their work. So for example, I might sell my wonderful book to a publisher to be published, but they need to put my name on the front cover. And needs to be, I need to be forever identified with that work as the author. They can't take my name off. At the same time as I have the right to be identified with it, I have the right to be anonymous if I want. So it's really about, I can be, choose how I want to be associated with the work. And it's as I intended the work to be, which is oversimplifying, but this, the moral rights provisions protect um, uh, mutilation of a work. So it's about your, um, let's see, your identity, your in association with, with the work that you've created. A famous example was, um, I have to someone go to Wikipedia, uh, what the case is. It's Eaton Center versus, I forget the artist's name, but it's, uh, a sculptures of geese in the Eaton Center in Toronto uh, that are installed there. At Christmas time, the mall put red ribbons around the geese with its, uh, I want to say it's Snow Flight is the name of the sculpture, but I may be wrong. They put red ribbons around the necks of the geese for Christmas, and the artist sued and won that the ribbons were frivolous and took away from the majesty of the work as he had intended. And it's a really famous case in Canada around moral rights. So it's a right to be identified and the right to have your work um, as it, you intended it to be. Different from copyrights, the right of the copyright owner, how that work will be used. And that's just a little bit about um, what the Copyright Act entails. It also includes exceptions. And these are so the copyright, the author's rights, uh, moral rights are are the author owner uh, provisions. The exceptions are, are rights for users. Uh, a huge, huge area of exception in the Act, and the Supreme Court's just clarified that it is uh, a user right, uh, not a defense. It's a right, and that is fair dealing. So, as users, we have the ability to use materials. It's fair dealing for the purposes of research, private study, education, parody, and satire, as well as news reporting and criticism, which are not, this is um, specifically from the Act, quote, it also includes news and, and criticism. It's fair dealing. Education, parody, and satire are new with the Copyright and Modernization Act, and we'll talk more about those, but we can use materials for these purposes. So I can take something and look at it in private and use, use that material um, as I choose for private study for research. That's a user right that I have, that you have, that students have. And that's been an interesting case around what, for example, for students in classrooms, is that private study, is that research? Now they've added education, does that, how are those things related? And uh, the most recent case, so, um, next slide coming up shortly, is actually concerned with, with private study and establish that private study doesn't mean it has to happen in splendid isolation. It actually could happen in a classroom situation. And in addition to fair dealing, which is for everyone, there's exceptions for all users. The Act includes specific exceptions for educational institutions. It also has exceptions for library, archives, and museums. In the, this, the Copyright Modernization Act uh, included a provision that clarified um, that school libraries were included as well under the provisions for libraries and what they're allowed to do, which are mainly around uh, preservation and document delivery. And we'll talk about those at the end of the presentation. So what's happened with copyright law? Um, most recent changes, there's been a lot of action. Um, access copyright, uh, Canadian Library Association, uh, the um, universities, uh, university educators, all, all kinds of action on the copyright portfolio, as well as numerous attempts to um, have a, amendments to the Copyright Act made. It was back in the mid-90s, it was, it was last amended, and didn't include many new technologies, including, say, PDRs, uh, and now it does. 
Uh, so the most recent changes and actions around copyright law, starting with um, July 12, 2012, the Supreme Court ruled in the case of Alberta Education versus the Canadian Copyright Licensing Agency. And that concerns um, that, that private study piece that I mentioned and what kind of proportion of photocopying was uh, possibly teachers doing that on behalf of students and this relationship between uh, a teacher and a student and are, are providing them with work that they needed to, to further their education. And uh, it was it's considered to be a big win for, for the education community, for the ministries of education. We'll talk more about that uh, around photocopying. Next, um, and in this time, the, the Copyright Modernization Act was, was being debated. It was um, nearly in full enacted on November 7th. And the only portions not enacted, I think, around the, the WIPO treaty in that. So it doesn't really apply to us. The portions that do are now enacted as of November. That added amendments and provisions to the, the Copyright Act. Um, some interesting stuff for education. And then, um, not sure how many people know this, as of January 1st, 2013, the Ministries of Education um, ceased paying access copyright. We are no longer licensed with access copyright. And I do have that in writing from the Ministry of Education in this province. So that's as of January. And I uh, didn't add it here, but news from yesterday, access copyright lawsuit against York University for the language they're using around uh, fair dealing guidelines, which actually are very similar to what the CMEC is suggesting in place of the access copyright language for schools, which we'll look at. So that's just yesterday. A uh, lot's happening around copyright law. I think someone mentioned around yesterday's action by access copyright. It has begun. But it really never stops around this whole area. I've tried for years to update some a copyright uh, website I have in my district and just sat there waiting for news of, of changes. Um, so it's things happening all the time. But these three things uh, we'll talk about today the, and how they apply to, to us in education. All right. So this uh, slide is all around some new exceptions in general. And you see that little asterisk at the top, because here's a page where I've really oversimplified. Um, many of these areas, 29.22, 23, 24, there's additional conditions applied to some of these. So I've really, really simplified here. So for more information, I um, urge you to look at those um, specific sections of the Act. But I'll just talk about them generally here, because these are the, the general provisions for all users, whereas um, I'd like to get more into the, the K-12 stuff today. But So added, as I mentioned, fair dealing for parity in satire. So that's now in there. So that was added in, in many countries. It was perfectly legal to <laughs> do parodies and satire work, not in Canada. So that was uh, definitely needed to be added to the Act. As well, we now have um, a reproduction for private purposes, and that's 29.22. And you'll see I've got the um, provisions of the Act included in, in most places throughout this presentation. And you can have a copy of the presentation as well, so you can have those references. But that um, particular provision, um, the reproduction for private purposes, I've included two examples. And again, this is one. There's lots of conditions on this, but allows somebody who owns the C a CD to um, copy that music on an MP3 player or an iPod, iPhone. So now we can legally transfer music and listen to that on our on our uh, Walkman. <laughs> That's the, how old the act is. As well, um, we can personally, on a personal level, transfer content from VHS tape to a DVD. If we own the tape, if it's legally been purchased. So, uh, secondly, um, 29.23, recording programs for later viewing. This is your PVR provision, so it allows us to, uh, it's also called time shifting, to uh, capture one copy of a program to watch at a later time. 29.24, backup copies. So as an individual, you now have the right to, uh, if you own the item, if it's legally been obtained, you can create a backup copy of that. And 29.21, non-commercial user-generated content. <laughs> which is a long way of saying uh, remixes and mashups. And I've got more information on the next slide about that. So again, really oversimplifying here. I urge you to, to uh, look at those items in more detail if you're interested in, in the general exceptions. 
but this one, user generated content, really applies to us. It's a very interesting uh, new provision in the Act. This is anybody can do this. And that is individuals can take an existing published work, and it has to be published, um, or otherwise available. Um, you can take that and create a new work from that, and you can disseminate the new work. So that's your, your mashups, your remixes. You can take content, or even a Prezi, uh, take photos, say, um, copies of book book covers, make that, create a new a new work out of that, use music, and you can disseminate that, say, put it up on YouTube. But again, there's there's the responsibility piece. That's that's a really great provision. Like the, the power in that, both for learning but in general, that we can we can now do that, is only granted us so long as, and there it is, the source is cited. So that existing published work needs to be properly cited, and it is included in the Act what, um, what that would look like. But it's very generally the author needs to be mentioned, or um, definitely, and um, if possible. Or, or the organization that that's created the work. So again, there's here's your legal grounds for for citation. You need to believe that the existing work is a non-infringing copy. So if there's anything to give you the sense that it has that existing work has been uploaded illegally, you can't use that. I've got a hand up here. <laughs> I will uh, cease the talk button and turn over to Sandra. Hi, can you hear me? Okay, I'll assume you can hear me. Um, my audio is cutting in and out, so I can't hear everything you're saying. But my question is related to things like at our school, we are u using a lot of uh, video star. We're making personal uh, music videos and putting them on blogs and websites and all kinds of things like that. So my question at this point is, I know what they're doing is they're using programs like apps like Video Star, where you can get an iTunes music, and then they are making their own music videos to this, and then they are putting these, as I say, on blogs. So I'm just wondering about the copyright repercussions for this. OK, great. Thanks, Sandra. And I see some other questions there around fair dealing. Um, it's a good question. I'd have to look at the terms of use of that of that site, but I think um, there's your condition. So long as the source of the music is cited, um, whatever images are being used in that creation, if it's being, it can be disseminated. Um, so long as it's, like I say, it, it sounds like the music from iTunes, which is a legal, uh, a legal source, so that covers off the, um, the belief that it's non-infringing. It definitely is um, a legal copy. And so, so, so long as it's cited, it's for non-commercial purposes, and it won't have a financial adverse effect or, or other adverse effect on the original, uh, I think that should be OK as, as per 29.21. And that would depend on, and I'd have to check the, um, the terms of use of that particular site. But um, other than that, um, there's your conditions. I, I, I think that should be covered. So again, so long as um, those conditions are covered off. So I hope that that answers your question. And as the question of the fair, no, oh, sorry, I'll let uh, Sandra go ahead. No, Sandra, did you want to add to your question? Sorry, am I talking now? I wanted to just know, I understand this part, that's clear, but now transferring this, these music videos then, even if they're cited for their uh, music and cited for their pictures, is it OK to then transfer them and put them on their blogs, wikis, websites, or in some cases now, Facebook pages? OK. So I'll read you the, the actual wording here, 29.21. So it's not an infringement of copyright for an individual to use the existing work, um, or other subject matter or copy of one which has been published. And I'm skipping a bit here. Um, and for the individual to use the new work or other subject matter, or to authorize an intermediary to disseminate it. 
So I, I do believe the dissemination would be okay. I can double check that, and if there's any question to that, I will uh, send an email to Arlene, and she can send that out with the PowerPoint. And I will check the video star as well, okay? Uh, as to the question, are there uh, the new fair dealing exceptions as flexible as in the U.S.? I'd have to check that. Um, they have added the education parity and satire, which I believe the U.S. had. They've had education in terms of showing the videos for some in the classroom for some time. So, not I'd have to check the U.S. law, but I think we've moved fairly close to what was available in the U.S. If not um, equal now, and. Yep, I see someone mentioning copyright matters. Yes, definitely check that uh, for more information. And there's really, it's a question and answer format. Lots of great information in copyright matters. And I see from Julie, uh, for transient content, is that only if there's a, not a commercially available? I believe that would be the case. It would have to be uh, only allowed if there's not a commercially available DVD version. And that's the case um, school libraries we are able to transfer a content that is in a format that is becoming obsolete, or if the technology used to show it is becoming obsolete, so that will be your, so your VHS tapes. But that's only if there's not a commercially available version. So if a DVD was available, you, um, you couldn't um, transfer it over. So I'm, I'd agree with you there, Julie. Copyright Matters, I've got a link in our the resources page at, at the end of the presentation. If you just Google that, Copyright Matters CMEC, uh, you can get that online. Is Netflix OK? We're coming up to that. I've got a, a slide on Netflix and video. So I will uh, continue with the presentation and move into the educational exceptions, because that, that's um, mentioned in here. So keep the questions coming. And uh, again, that's user-generated content. There's your summary, your conditions, and I will check into the dissemination and let Arlene know so she can send that out to you. Okay, so moving into the educational exceptions. So in addition to fair use of parody and satire, as I already mentioned, there's fair use for education, and that's now been added. Oh, someone's added the link, great, to Copyright Matters. Uh, secondly, we've got um, great new provisions around reproduction for instruction. So did you know you can now display work on a whiteboard <laughs> and project it using an LCD projector? In fact, I think overhead projectors were just added uh, not too many years ago to the Act. It was amended um, just very slightly uh, at one point. But that's uh, <laughs> now been in the Act that we can use and project material if we need to, again, if so long as um, there isn't a commercially available format already. And we can include copyrighted materials in tests or exams. So that's included in 29.4. And again, you see the asterisks on the slide. This is one where there's uh, conditions to all of these. So I urge you to check um, for more information, copyright matters, or, or the actual provisions in the Act. And I'll be going over all of these in, in more detail as well. Um, recording performance, we can perform works, plays, music, TV, motion pictures. And some of those aren't new, but uh, motion pictures, there's a change there. And uh, that's around uh, PPR and educational content. No, no more PPR, um, as we know it. Um, we can, there's been some changes to our ability to make copies of news programs and in other programs, 29.6. And internet materials, here's a big one, lobbied hard by, by the CMEC and, and teachers, ministries of education, the ability to use the internet <laughs> to print, to, to take material from the internet and use that for educational purposes. And that has been added with conditions. It's 30.04. As well, um, some provisions around, say, distributed learning. So you can communicate lessons via telecommunication. And this is, um, let's say, online classes. Uh, online uh, virtual virtual school portals, 30.01. Lots of conditions on that, lots of conditions on that. And I've added some pieces around alternate formats, um, just, just uh, 
in FYI, I already mentioned the school library piece, um, our ability to, to um, deal with obsolescent materials. So that's uh, 30.1 in part, and uh, I've got a few other things in that section. So some really great new new educational exceptions, again, over summarizing um, the conditions here on this particular slide. OK. Fair use for education has been added to the Act, but it's not defined. There's no definition for education in the Copyright Act. So it's in there. What does it mean? And does that mean we can use anything? Um, does the other provisions, how does that even work if we've got this overall great, huge provision just for fair use? Why do we even need any of the others? So although education is not defined in the Copyright Act, um, the Supreme Court back, I think it was 2004, um, established that fairness can be determined. It's a two-part test. The first part is, what is the purpose? Is it for education? Is it for research or private study? So would it be considered um, fair dealing? I guess that should be fair dealing instead of fair use there. Um, the second part of the test establishes that you can determine fairness by considering the factors that are outlined here. So what was the purpose, the character, the amount of the dealing, were there any alternatives, the nature, and the effect of the dealing on the current work. And that second part of the test acts to uh, clarify a, a question such as, um, does the whole fair dealing for education mean that we can copy textbooks? Do we even need to pay for them anymore? Can we just photocopy them and, and give, them to, give them to students? Well, the, uh, the factors there are the amount of the dealing. That's a significant amount of copying. Is there an alternative? Yes, we can buy them. Um, significant effect financially for the publishers. So that um, particular question or fails against this fairness test. So it's, uh, these factors help us to determine what, you know, how to um, interpret that whole fair, fair dealing for education. So no for copying textbooks, in short, <laughs> because of the, the amount, the nature, the effect that it has. See so a question there, if there's no more PPR, there's no more ACF and VEC site licenses and reporting. Correct. <laughs> no more licenses and reporting. But some, I believe some districts have chosen to continue with their educational licenses. Some have um, relicensed for uh, non-education purposes, and we'll look at more at that. But yeah, no more reporting if you don't don't have a license anymore. So from video to photocopying. So as I mentioned, the ministry, uh, as of January 31st, ceased to pay uh, the access copyright tariff. So we're now in uh, unknown territory. Uh, for years, we've had those copyright notices and 10% this and one chapter that on, on photocopiers, whether it was a university library and you were photocopying journals for your bachelor's degree um, in school and continue to see those, um, no longer applies. So what does apply? So again, here's this whole fair, fair dealing for education, fair use. It, um, no definition of education. You know what? What? What are the specific guidelines for photocopying? So, luckily, uh, the CMEC, that's the Council of Ministers of Education, and they've taken the lead on on copyright. They, they're the ones who publish that Copyright Matters uh, booklet, and they've developed a fair dealing guidelines. And there's the link. I've uh, tried to make it um, usable for you in this format. And those outline their suggested photocopying limits for schools. And I believe, I presume that they would uh, consider it's a one page, um, 8.5 by, 8 by 11 um, poster, that this would replace um, the posters that we used to have from Access Copyright on photocopiers. And according to the CMEC, these guidelines not only um, take into effect that the fair dealing for education that um, now added to the Act. They also take into account um, the Alberta Supreme Court ruling from July as well as the 2004. So if you look at those, it's um, a two-column explanation of limits um, that talk about this, these things called short excerpts. And that was um, what Alberta won in that particular case in July. The court um, 
found that very long, I'm really oversimplifying now, um, that short excerpts could be provided to students by teachers in certain situations. Now this is what uh, Access Copyright <laughs> has uh, determined is you know, really, and I'm speaking for them, this is very complicated, um, really oversimplifying and uh, potentially misinterpreting what the court ruled and what, what um, how fair dealing should be assessed. And that's uh, why they launched a lawsuit yesterday against York University for including in their fair dealing guidelines a very similar language around these short excerpts. They've also uh, launched two other um, actions, and one concerns the, the education tariff to try to uh, force the Ministries of Education back into having to pay for the tariff. So I, I included a one page um, from a blog, Excess Copyright, that has commentary on, on what happened yesterday. And there's the news release that's on the Access Copyright site, but I don't have a link here. It's also interesting. So lots happening yet as uh, basically there, you know, it's Access Copyright's business model. Um, and huge amounts of money, millions of dollars, that our own ministry was paying for this, um, disrupted by um, uh, the ministries of education feeling quite confident that they no longer had to pay for this. So just um, some interesting note there. And there's that fair dealing guidelines, if you're interested. And I see a question for Arlene. I will hand over the mic here. Thanks, Heather. While we're waiting for those court decisions, because they take quite a long time, do you have any advice to us as, how, as to how we should advise our staff? Should they just proceed as they did in the past with a kind of ballpark of 10% or follow the, uh, the fair dealing guidelines? What do you think? Hi, thanks for the question. Uh, it's a really good one around um, how courageous we're willing to be, how much we feel we can rely on on that fair dealing guideline. The ministry is very confident. They wouldn't have ceased paying. I mean, the, the potential of losses and the amount of money involved for them to cease paying this license if they weren't confident. Uh, I did talk to them, and um, they do have a, a risk management piece around this. And they, they really did feel like um, they could cease paying. So. Generally, the if you look at the fair dealing guidelines, you see they're they are limited. They they do replicate in a way some of the language. They still talk about the one percent, the one chapter. They're they're quite reasonable. So it is um, whether you feel quite confident in that the Ministry of Education has chosen to to stop paying. They haven't released. Um, other than copyright matters, which I think some people might have received in print form in their mailboxes. There hasn't, um, to my knowledge, been anything released from the ministry around any changes. So, yeah. So, so long as, however, you feel confidence in the Ministry of Education's decision. I mean, at the end of the day, um, they were the ones paying originally, and I believe they'd be the ones who um, who would probably be be sued and not individual schools. Um, so, um, don't want to say one way or the other exactly, but I hope that helps in terms of um, just you, you're feeling confident in, in the decisions that, that they've made. Arlene? Thanks, Heather. Just uh, give you voice to another question here. Uh, this one from Julie. Um, it goes back to the question of uh, paying the license fees for uh, audio C and uh, to audio C and VEC. And it concerns, I think, the distinction between showing movies for educational purposes and outside of school time or either as a money maker or even not as a money maker inside school time but for non-educational purposes. And I'm wondering if you can clarify on that, please. Okay, thanks, Julie, for the question. Um, I see it there. Thoughts on teachers who show a video to entertain children. So the new language in the Act is for educational purposes. Um, I would say just because it's a teacher and just because it's students doesn't necessarily mean that the use of the video is educational. It's, it's really the purpose for how it's being used. In that case, it would be for entertainment, I would say. It's, as you say there, it's not exactly for educational purposes. It's for other purposes. 
So just because the situation is educational, because there's teachers and students in the room, it might be at a school, it's the actual showing of the video is for entertainment. And that's not covered in the Act. You'd need a separate license for that still. And as for a fundraiser, do you need coverage? Do you need a license? Yes, you would. So the Act is only for educational use. Any other purpose, you continue to need a license. And around setting photos, if you use photos from, I think that's Creative Commons, do you need to cite them? I would say yes, you do. Yep. Okay, so moving into the video more, and we'll, we'll talk more about that now. Um, so this section is 29.5. It's, it's a really neat section of the Act, the educational exceptions. It concerns performances. So we can play radio, TV, uh, internet broadcast to students. Um, for something, there's a word missing there, <laughs> at the time of broadcast. So you can play live radio, play live TV. We can also play sound recordings, so put a CD on. You can have live performances, so play or drama. That's all in here. Um, in, in both cases, this is allowed so long as it's on school property and that it's done for nonprofit educational purposes. So again, not for entertainment, it needs to be for education. But what about playing music at a dance? Is that uh, more of an entertainment purpose? And uh, that's not covered in the Act. However, ERAC, that's the Education Resource Acquisition Consortium, representing um, I think all school districts now, as well as a number of private schools, they have an agreement with SOCAN. I think it's the Society of Canadian I something something. <laughs> Sorry about that. It's the um, music publishers. Um, it allows for additional uses of music in schools. And so that agreement with SOCAN allows us to play music for entertainment, and that includes school dances. So we can play them for education under the Copyright Act. We can play them for entertainment, because ERAC has an agreement with SOCAN. And I do have the link to that agreement in the resources section at the end of the presentation. Question about Netflix. Um, Copyright Matters makes it seem like you cannot show Netflix. Is this correct? Yes, it is correct. You cannot show Netflix <laughs> in the classroom. And we'll talk about that right here. So public performance rights, PPR, it's no longer needed for if you're purchasing a DVD. It doesn't have to have PPR on it, mentioned in it. Um, so if you get an, an advertisement from a vendor, yay PPR, you don't need that anymore kind of that concept um, is sort of gone in terms of purchase. I had a question from one school district. Can we buy DVDs now from Costco? And thank you, Arlene. <laughs> Arlene just saved me. It's a society of composers, authors, and music publishers. So can. Thank you so much. Um, the question was, can I buy uh, videos from or DVDs from Costco? And uh, yes, you can. You always could buy them from Costco. Uh, the law concerns showing them in classroom, not, not buying them. So you can buy them from any vendor. It, again, it comes down to the purpose for which you would be showing the video. So we can now show legal copies of movies and other moving images um, to audience primarily consisting of students. So that is language directly from the Act. And that means um, you know, it can't be a, a movie night for parents or primarily um, a, a community event. This needs to be primarily students, maybe uh, teachers, a few parents in the audience. But for the most part, it's intended to be uh, in, a, in a regular classroom setting or, say, in the gym. It doesn't actually specify so much. It's just around the audience. And we can show movies so long as, again, audience consisting of students, it's a legal copy, it's on school property, and it's for nonprofit education purposes. So if it's for any other purpose, say for entertainment, this particular provision would not apply, and we'd need additional licensing. So many school districts, um, for example, mine here in Coquitlam, I think um, our name was saying West Vancouver as well has, um, rather, we used to have to have licenses to allow the education showing of videos. And we've changed those now to an entertainment license, which would cover off things like, um, say, a snow day or um, after school use, a, a daycare or something on school property, just to make sure we're covered for, for the entertainment component that um, many videos are still shown in schools for both 
but um, certainly in the case of my district, we, we did that um, because uh, of the risk involved. But we made it clear that at the same time, we're not encouraging the entertainment use of video. We are an educational institution. And um, if, if it happens to, to be the case where a video is shown for entertainment, um, you know, I'm not sure what the situation is. As far as the district's concerned, it's, it's the risk of being sued, but um, not necessarily an encouragement of, of the entertainment use. So again, we can legally show movies obtained from legal source to students for education purposes. Yeah, I'm just looking at some of the questions here. Fair dealing at nonprofit schools. Oh, that's a really good question. I will have to look into that, Sandra. I'm writing it down. Copyright matter. See, the, the, the Act just talks about education and doesn't define it. So I, I'd have to look at what Copyright Matters says about um, being nonprofit. It might just be the way they word it, because the Act doesn't talk about um, nonprofit at a very general level. They talk about, um, say in this case, the movies, nonprofit, in terms of you know, it can't be a fundraiser that that video is being, being utilized at. But the um, question if the school is for profit, I'm not sure. I, um, so I've written that down. I'll, I'll look into that more. And can we need a, do we need a circulation license to lend to students, assuming they'll be viewing it outside of school? Hmm. I will think about that as well. I don't think so because it would be, then be for private study, and that's covered under the fair, fair dealing provisions for private study. So I, I don't think you would need a, a circulation license. And I'll, if I find out otherwise, I'll, I'll let Arlene know to email you. But I would say you do not need a circulation license. And I see Arlene has a question. I will hand over the mic. Hey, Peter, I'm just curious, are, is there a difference between a circulation license and just attaching public performance rights to the DVD because I think in public libraries, I know you can borrow a video that doesn't have public performance rights. I guess maybe there is a separation between circulation licensing and public public performance rights. I don't know. Maybe you can clarify. I think circulation licensing was more for, say, a district resource center who is buying one copy and lending that out to multiple schools. So rather than buying, say, in our case, 67 copies of the video, they could uh, pay the additional um, amount of money for a circulation license to be able to just have the one, as opposed, that's a, as opposed to a site license, which would be for individual sites. So we'd have, say, 67 site licenses and just the one circulation license. I don't think um, it applies so much in terms of public performance rights. There, one's about um, you know, sort of lending, and one's about showing or performing. Um, someone just asked, can we show a Learn360 video for fundraising? Um, if you have the appropriate license for the, um, pub, our vendors, or sorry, the, um, what's the word, the movie studios that Learn360 represents. Learn360 is um, the same company as uh, Visual Education Center, which is one of the two major licensors. Is that even a word? Sorry. Uh, for um, the video licenses, there's uh, VEC and ACF, which have come up in the chat stream. So Learn360 is related to, to the uh, same company as for the VEC license. So you probably need a, a VEC fundraising license, and in which case you could use their video. They, Learn360 has a component um, specifically for, for um, their motion picture. Piece. If you go to the Learn360 site and log in, it's actually right in the middle of the page. It's a nice bit of advertising for that other component that you can buy with Learn360 that's just for their, their motion pictures, and you need their fundraising license. So I would say, yes, you can show it for fundraising so long as you have a license with their, their VEC arm. And lending DVDs to students, I think you can, because it, it would just you know, the videos are usually for home use only. It just becomes then the purpose they'd be um, looking at it at home would be for home use, for private study. Um, so we're able to show it in the classroom for education use. If they take it home, it would be them using the video and showing it for, for private use. So both would be okay. 
So it doesn't really matter where the video comes from. It's really about the purpose for which you're showing it. That, that really matters here. And again, to uh, speak to Netflix, which has come up in, in the chat there as a question. And this is mentioned in Copyright Matters. Um, it's, a, it's very short mention. I think it's just one a sentence or two around subscription services. I don't think they include examples there either. But um, there is a mention there around not being able to use subscription video services in the classroom. And it's basically any subscription service uh, where there's sort of a, a contract, where you've subscribed to a service, you've had to agree to some sort of terms of use, which is a contract in the process of subscribing. And if those terms of use, that contract stipulates for personal use only, and that might be other wording, it might be home use, it might be whatever the wording is, um, that if it's for personal use, if you've agreed it's for personal use, then it cannot be used in the classroom. So that is the case of Netflix. Netflix is a, a terms of use, a contract piece. It's a subscription service. It's for home use, personal use only. And according to Copyright Matters, it cannot be used in the classroom. Interestingly, you can take a physical DVD that has a Interpol home use warning right at the beginning. You can use that in the classroom. But Netflix, which has similar wording, but in a contractual form, can't be used. And the difference between the two is, is the contract. You are uh, physically agreeing, clicking on something that says that you will, will only use it for that purpose. And that, that is the difference between the two. Um, a BCTLA member had a great question. I think it was around iTunes. And just that being a little bit different from Netflix. And it's not necessarily a subscription service, but it does include a personal use term. And that question um, was referred by the, our Ministry of Education to CMEC for more information. So I think we may we may see more information around this, this piece. But um, uh, right now, again, if there's a contract that's been agreed to, if there's terms of use that's been clicked off on, including Netflix, uh, that includes that personal use only wording, um, that cannot be used at this time in the classroom. Just an interesting piece around movies, other what we can and can't show, <laughs> and, uh, and how contractual law, I guess, in this case, trumps copyright law. So that's um, movies. If anyone has any more questions about that, um, let me know in, in the sidebar there. And I see someone mentioning public libraries circulate DVDs. And yes, they do. So I don't see an issue with that. Uh, circulating uh, DVDs or, or reference books. I think that's just something over time we just think, you know, that those are things that don't circulate or maybe there's a financial concern for us. But uh, they're really, I don't think there's an issue with, with circulation of, of DVDs or, or reference other than, um, you know, losing an individual copy of an encyclopedia set or, or the money or damage involved. One last thing around uh, video and um, broadcast programming, and that's around news. And these are uh, quotes from the Iraq copyright course, which has just been revised. And the link is, again, included here in the re resources page at the end of the presentation. And I just wanted to mention them here. It's 29.6 and 29.7. And that's teachers can make a single copy of a news or news commentary program at the time of broadcast. So you can tape it. <laughs> and, uh, for any other type of broadcast program, you can tape that as well. You can evaluate it for up to 30 days if you want to show that recording within that 30 days. Or if you keep it beyond 30 days, you must pay a royalty. So two, uh, I just wanted to mention them in terms of video. Here's just two provisions around news. As you can tell, they're fairly complicated provisions. So here, just mentioning, if you'd like more information, um, check out Copyright Matters or, or 29.6, 29.7. Okay, internet, it's a great new provision, 30.04. So material available on the internet can be reproduced, communicated, or performed to or for students. Again, much lobbied um, addition to the act. And that particular first bullet there, again, is an oversimplification. 
and here are your conditions. So we can use material on the internet so long as, there it is again, the source is cited. So teachers can use um, internet materials in lessons. Students can use internet materials in uh, any productions they're making uh, so long as, as they cite their the, the source of that um, internet material. It can't be from a site that is uh, protected by a technological protection measure, a TPM. So for example, if it's password protected, you can't go in there and, and copy that information. The password um, piece or other kind of digital lock serves as the copyright owner deciding they don't want their material to be, to be used in that manner, and we, we can't get around that. We also can't um, use material if there's a clearly visible notice, either on the material itself or on the site. And that has to be more than just the copyright symbol. So it needs to be a really clear message saying, do not use this material. Otherwise, uh, we, can, we can use it. And again, it needs to be legally available. Um, it can't be clearly illegally uploaded. So if we can uh, see that you know, clearly it hasn't been uploaded with the consent of the copyright owner, we cannot utilize that under this particular provision. So again, we can now use the internet material available freely, so long as it's not protected in any way. And it has to be very protected, uh, so long as um, we've cited the source. So another uh, legal grounds for, for citation. And that's a really um, nice new exception for, for us in schools and to universities and colleges. And for DL, I mentioned this here because um, this, a lot of these I've included because the questions have come up recently. And um, this one was teachers at one of our schools including material in online sort of course packs and uh, making online lessons that include copyright material. And that's sort of covered here under its 30.01. It's around uh, electronic lessons. They can be securely, so it has to be all kinds of uh, secure, and, you know, I think a password protected environment, probably an internet, securely transmitted these lessons to students online. Students can make recordings of the lessons. They can't share them, um, and they have to delete them. So we can create online lessons, securely transmit them to our students. They can make recordings, so long as it's not for profit is for educational use only, and that 30 days after students receive their final evaluation, um, they need to delete any recording they've made. And there's a mention there around teachers need to delete the copyrighted material. And that's one thing I need to look more into that, what that would look like, whether you need to delete the whole thing or, or just the, the particular instances of the copyrighted material. And what happens if you want to use that lesson over time? But Here's this piece around um, 30.01. Again, recommend, it's quite complex, um, looking at the copyright matters or 30.01 itself, if this applies to you. As uh, someone's mentioned there, um, delivering this particular section alone to, to staff, and this is a teacher lover and tomorrow at a secondary school who will be doing that. Um, it's, it is, um, it's interesting, and it's in some cases, you know, the the whole Netflix piece isn't necessarily something that um, is uh, is great news, because that would be ideally something that that they'd like to use. I I'll think more around that, how to deliver the the information in a nutshell. I've actually really uh, condensed a lot of it. This is um, a whole act's worth of information into the PowerPoint. You can have this course, but uh, um, it is. This, I know this provision and others are very, very complex pieces. So, so just mentioning this here because it did come up for, for that teacher lover in, in, that I know of who will be presenting on this for her staff who is in this situation. So just three more slides here. This one, alternate formats. And I mentioned uh, this is section 32. It's not new, but I just wanted to highlight it uh, just so that we know it's, you know, as for many of um, people who are on now or who will be watching this presentation are teacher librarians and concerned with, with content and that availability, that we can produce material in alternate formats for individuals with perceptual difficulties. So if students have special needs and uh, need different formats and materials, um, 
except for large print books, um, we were able to um, produce the type of formats they need to access the material. So I already mentioned um, the school libraries. So this is our, co our collection. So it can't be uh, someone has a personal VHS tape at home and would like that to be transferred. Uh, this is uh, the school library or school collection. That, that material can be um, reproduced in alternate formats so long as it's in a format becoming obsolete or if the technology required to use the original is becoming obsolete. And that's 30.01. So that, for example, will cover your, your VHS to DVD if, if that is um, considered to be obsolete now or if you no longer have the, uh, the video machines or they're available to buy, uh, we can uh, make uh, DVD materials or alternate formats out of those tapes. Both of these provisions, the third bullet there, are subject, again, to an appropriate item not being commercially available. So if uh, we have that VHS, and it might be obsolete in our situation, but there's a DVD that we can buy, uh, we need to buy the DVD. We are not able to use 30.01 in that case. And, oh, copyright associated with YouTube. Um, just reading it. Yeah, I think that, again, that's that user-generated content piece. The movie is created. If they can create it, they can disseminate it. I will look more into the dissemination, but I, I think that that's covered. And a few other things around school libraries. Um, we can libraries, archives, museums, and they've clarified it that it includes school libraries as well, that on behalf of our patrons, so on behalf of individuals, we can do anything for them that they can do personally. So this is, um, for example, an interlibrary loan situation where it you know, really covers, say, university or public library situation where someone is working remotely or, or a DL situation, in our case, um, who needs a copy, say, of an article. Um, personally, they would be able to copy that article, and we are able to copy that on their behalf as a as, you know, school library personnel. That's 30.02. As well, we can deliver that content in print or digitally. Although there's a, a piece around digital copies, it needs to be one copy. They can't share it, and they only have five days to look at it, and we need to ensure that that's the case, and I'm not quite sure how we would do that, but I mention it here so we can give them digital copies under these conditions, uh, so long as individuals only use them for research and private study. So just a piece around what um, school libraries can do for individuals who so we, we can act as this intermediary between individuals and content and do things for them. And finally, just want to draw your attention to parallel importation. And this is, not again, not new in the Act, although I think it used to be part of the regulations, and now it's um, been included as 27.1. I might be wrong. It might have always been there. I know it was in the regulations, but this is around um, importing books from over the border. So if a copyright of a book is owned by a publisher in Canada, for example, say Harry Potter owned by Raincoast here in the Lower Mainland, that it would be an infringement of copyright in under certain conditions if we were to import that book from the U.S. where the copyright's owned by Scholastic. And this really applies to school libraries. There's all kinds of conditions around this. The uh, publisher in Canada has to adhere to commitments around timelines. It has to be available. We're allowed a certain number of copies. So I just wanted, again, very complex, just draw your attention to this piece that is um, of uh, some interest to school libraries, and that is uh, 27.1 parallel importation or importation of books in the Act, and that specific to um, bringing books over the border. So if you're ordering, say, from Amazon.com as opposed to .ca, and I just see, yeah, Arlene just answering there, and this is the last page. And that's the resources. So I've, again, tried to make them um, uh, simple in this particular format. There's Copyright Matters. The link's been posted in the chat. And um, 
there I could just tiny I just made tiny CC slash copyright matters. There's the fair dealing guidelines. Thirdly is the ERAC copyright course. I believe that it's just been revised. I'm not sure if the revisions are up and login is required. You can just uh, sign up on the ERAC site. But if you'd like to go through in much detail, so this is a course on, on copyright. This was an hour. This particular ERAC resource is, is a course in all of this and specific to the K-12. to And there it is, that, uh, that particular URL. There's your link to that ERAC SOCAN agreement. Um, around using music for other purposes than education purposes in, in the classroom and in schools. And the last link is to Copyright Collective Societies. So SOCAN is a collective society that represents uh, publishers, distributors. In this case, it's um, music uh, publishers. And Access Copyright is another one that represents um, uh, print publishers, others. Um, so there's a whole list of them there if you're ever interested in who owns the rights to what or who to contact for more information. There's the um, link to the collectives. And I'm, it's 5 o'clock, so if you need to go, please, there's just a few other questions here in the uh, chat. I don't think there's an, a difference in the impact between public and independent schools, but I'm going to just double check what the copyright word uh, matters wording is that um, Sandra mentioned. But, um, believe there is no difference for, for public versus independent schools. What about ebooks? That's a great question. And I will look into that more. I will, I'd have to check. So I'll write that one down too. So I've got a few of them here. Um, feel free to email me though. Uh, and most of you know my email and it's on if you're on the BCTLA forum, it's there a lot. It's just um, H daily. It's D A L Y at sd43.bc.ca. If you have any other questions or if anything ever comes up, uh, I do have contacts and I can try to get the answer for you around copyright. I get a lot of copyright questions. I'm always happy uh, to help. And many are really, really um, dependent on individual circumstances. Um, this has been a really, really general overview of, of what, what's out there. Um, but there might be individual considerations. So feel free to email me. I, should have included my email there. But again, it's just hdaily at sd43.bc.ca. Thank you, Arlene. Arlene's included it for me. And um, yeah, I'll watch for any other questions in the chat. But otherwise, I'm just going to turn it back over um, now to Arlene. And perhaps she can tell you about the next session, which is all around citation, which is uh, really topical because a lot of what we talked about today is um, uh, dependent upon uh, citation. Thanks very much.